All right, so we'll get started. Uh, let me first say, let, introduce a few people here. This is John Welch, the IT manager for the Secretary of State's office. Will Senning, you've already met, but he's our elections director. Uh, Chris Winters is my um, uh, deputy secretary. Lori is standing over in the corner. Uh, she's one of our election administrators. So um, this was successful for us two years ago. It answers a lot of questions that the media may have going into the election process. So we'll get started. Uh, voter registration, I just, I, I got some numbers I can update you with. If have, Eric, have you passed these out, the numbers? I have. Yeah. Okay, so, but just uh, for, the, for the camera, um, we currently have, as of today, 482,900 uh, uh, registered voters. Um, we have, as far as early and absentee ballot requests, as of today, this morning, it was 52,600. That compares to a total uh, ballots that were actually cast, uh, early ballots that were cast in, in uh, 2014 of 33,400. We've already received back of that 52,000. We've already received back almost 36,000. So we're well ahead of the pace of the last midterm election in 2014. And for comparison's sake, um, at the, at the uh, uh, for the 2016 presidential election, which we usually have higher numbers, uh, at this point in time, we had 63,600 uh, uh, requests for ballots. And at the end of the day, uh, on election day, we had 95,000 actually cast. So we're, we're kind of in the middle between 14 and 16, which is a, is a good sign that people are getting out to vote. Um, there's no longer a deadline to register. This is the first general election with election day registration. Uh, you can vote on, you can actually register online at your town clerk's office or at the polls on election day. If, if we don't recommend you wait, because if you do, uh, the online voter registration, although it's easy, the town clerks will, uh, as we get closer to the election, will be very busy. So it's best if you're gonna, if you're gonna wait until you register, either register on election day at the polls um, or register at their office. Uh, we also have what we call my voter page. This is a unique voter page for each registered voter in the state of Vermont. You can use the, the MVP page to request and track an early ballot, locate your polling place, update any registration information, like if you move to a different apartment or a different house or a different town. Uh, you can update all that information there. You can also view a sample ballot. You can see how to contact your town clerk, uh, whether it be by email or, or phone. <coughs> what we have new in 2018 is to continue to improve our ranking as the most accessible election system in the country, making it easier to vote while dif more difficult to cheat. MIT has a, a prestigious election performance ind index. It's called the EPI. Uh, it, used to be, it was started by the, Brennan, uh, by the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, and then MIT took it over. It's a data-driven system, and they rank all 50 states. We were 38th in the nation in 2012. After the 2012 election, we were uh, 16th after the 14 election. And after the 16 election, we just got the information. We are now number one in the country. And it's really due to the new state-of-the-art system that we've put in place. Uh, we... Um, New this year, we have same-day voter registration, and we also have automatic voter registration. So here's some election stats you can see from 2008 through 2018. Uh, we have, in 2008, 453,000 registered voters, and we've worked our way up now to 482,900. Uh, absentee requests in 2008, a presidential year, and again in 16, a presidential year. We were over 90,000 uh, ballots that were requested and returned. Uh, in 2012, it was 76,000 requests. Actually, only about 33, I'm sorry, in 12, yeah. Um, that was also a presidential year. So you can see it was a little off that year. But in 2018 so far, we are surpassing uh, previous year's uh, midterm elections. 
Uh, we have 52,000 that were requested so far and 35,000, almost 36,000 that have been returned so far to the town clerks. This is a data-driven system. The clerks have to input this data as they receive these ballots, and they do work hard to maintain that. On election day, we have several procedures that will be in place. Uh, we've done a lot of preparation and training. Lori has been all over the state of Vermont uh, this, uh, this summer. Uh, one, for doing the training on the new accessible voting system, but also to train on election procedures. Uh, the town clerks and any of their election officials are invited to those, uh, and it's a requirement that the town clerks uh, do uh, take that training. Uh, the polling place hours, I think most of you are aware, the polls will open anywhere from 5 a.m. in the morning till uh, uh, 10, 10 a.m. Uh, they have that option, that window to decide when they want to open. They all close at 7 p.m. on election day. Uh, that's uniform across the state. Um, we have, uh, obviously we have certain towns that have tabulators. Uh, those towns that have tabulators, there's 135 of them. Um, out of the 246 towns, uh, the, uh, the 135 towns with tabulators actually represent about 80% of the votes in the state of Vermont. Um, there is a mandate by the legislature that any town with 1,000 voters or more must have a tabulator. Um, we also uh, obviously have early ballots. We, have, uh, we don't use the affidavit anymore, but it's still available to us if necessary. The affidavit was actually used in, in place of provisional ballots, uh, and we also uh, field eligibility questions. Election night reporting, prior to uh, 2012, there was no election night reporting. Essentially, it was the media. Uh, and if you were watching the, the three, three or four stations, if you had them all up uh, at the same time, like they do at the party headquarters, the numbers would be different from one station to the next because it depended on who you contacted. Well, we now have an election night reporting system that started in 2012 and we ramped it up more in 14 and 16. Uh, we have excellent results from our website uh, where you can actually uh, see the, the information is, is updating or refreshing every five minutes. You just hit the refresh button um, and we expect to Usually on, a, on general election night, which is actually a little bit easier than the primary night, because primary days are, are uh, uh, we actually are running three separate elections, one for each party of the major parties, and on general election it's just one ballot, so th we expect that those results will start flowing in sooner. Uh, generally not till about 8 o'clock, a little after 8, that the numbers actually start to show up. Um, we will be staffing here at this office. Uh, I know Will and Lori will be here early in the morning uh, prior to, well, everybody else is still asleep. They'll be here uh, and uh, we'll have staff here in the building until uh, probably after midnight. Um, for the media, there is an RSS feed. I think most of uh, your stations have been contacted already uh, to connect to the RSS feed. It's pretty simple uh, uh, connection on, on our website. Um, and we also will be working with Twitter and Facebook uh, to combat any misinformation. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but what, what or actually I mentioned it I think in one of the interviews I just did, but uh, uh, the National Association of Secretaries of State and the National Association of uh, election, State Election Directors have worked out with uh, both Twitter and Facebook. Facebook has we can actually communicate with them directly if we see something online that, that shouldn't be there. Um, if it's misinformation, for instance, uh, Democrats vote on Tuesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday, or the polling place is open until 10 o'clock, you don't have to go until, there's no lines after 7, when we all know that it closes at 7. If we see something like that or hear about something like that, we will contact Facebook or Twitter. Twitter, we're going to go through our associations our national associations uh, as a portal that's going to be the, the, feed, the feed point to the uh, platform. With Facebook, we will, as, as states, have that access. Uh, and we plan on um, monitoring as much as we can, but obviously both platforms are huge uh, and we can't watch everything, so we're going to rely on people telling us as well.
Uh, polling place rules. Uh, we have we've provided guidance to all the town clerks. There are legal requirements that are set out in statute. Um, poll watchers and election observers. There will be election observers in the state from overseas. Um, it's the OSCE.org uh, is the organization, and they have people pretty much across the country. On, uh, they've been here now. For, they've already been here for a little while. They've left. They're now coming back until through election day, uh, and they're just watching from an election perspective uh, from overseas. Um, we have uh, an election complaint process for us, uh, and people can report to us. The election day hotline number is 1-800-439-VOTE, which translates to 8683. Uh, people can call us directly. We are in communication with the FBI, the Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office, and Homeland Security Partners. Um, we do on election day have a election day threat dashboard that the Department of Homeland Security has set up through what we call the Election Infrastructure ISAC, and it's, ISAC stands for Information Sharing Analysis Center. Um, so we do have a, a, um, uh, a threat dashboard that all 50 states and over 1,200 uh, uh, counties or, or local communities will be connected to. So if, if something is happening somewhere, say in Arizona, uh, and they, they can post it on there, to let us know what's going on in the rest of the country, you can see it as well, so we can prepare uh, a defense if we need to. Uh, as far as our election security, uh, we were the first agency in state government to adopt a cybersecurity plan. If we also fortified our de de our defenses based on the results, that was a full blown vulnerability and risk assessment that we did back in 2013. Um, We've had several uh, penetration tests that we've done since then. The latest one was the end of April, and we got the report in May, and it essentially said, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing it, but it said that we were, uh, actually, Peter, you had that, so you know what it said, but it, it said that uh, we had a well-defensed, we were a mature, well-defensed system. Um, and I credit that to, to the team because we actually started working on this back in 2013, uh, probably ahead of where most states were. Um, to put it bluntly, uh, everything changed in 2016 uh, when we received a phone call to get on a, a conference call with Department of uh, Homeland Security and Secretary Jay Johnson, uh, and he informed the secretaries of state across the country that 21 states had been attacked, one had been breached. Um, we um, were not one of the 21 states, so we were pleased about that. Uh, but we didn't find that out until a year later. In the meantime, in January of 2017, they named uh, uh, elections infrastructure as a critical infrastructure, and that opened us up to have more resources available from the federal government. Things like weekly hygiene scans. We have a We've been conducting with, through the Department of Homeland Security, a weekly uh, cyber hygiene scan. They, essentially what they do is they look to see if they, any vulnerabilities have opened up in the previous week. Um, and they issue a report that John receives uh, and is able to act on if necessary. Um, you know, it, to put it in layman's terms, when, when a, a, a bad actor is scanning our system, and we get thousands of scans per day, but when a bad actor is scanning our system, it's like a burglar walking up to your house in the middle of the night, jiggling the doorknob, looking in your windows to try to see if there's any place he can get in. Um, that's what they do with a, with a scan, and is they're looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, we've pretty much shored everything up. As I said, we started back in 2013. Uh, and we have focused very much on, on putting in web application firewalls and a few other things that if I told you all, John would tell, you'd probably shoot me. <laughs> so um, we do penetration testing on a regular basis. We have firewalls at all entry points. Um, we are a member, a separate member. All 50 states are members of the MSISAC. That stands for Multi-State Information Sharing Analysis Center. Uh, we chose to be, and many of my colleagues chose to become an independent me uh, member of the MSISAC so that we had available certain uh, issues or certain um, 
uh, things that we could do, resources that we could access. Um, I've got my security clearance so I can receive uh, any information that, that they need to uh, pass along. Uh, I'm a member of the government governing coordinating council, the GCC, uh, which is under the MSISAC. Um, and it's a ba basically federal and state partners together, uh, and we control the, the communications protocol. Uh, and we've also, our staff has taken it upon itself to secure the human um, with our, our uh, town clerks. What we've done is actually produced a, uh, through one of our vendors, they produced a two hour WebEx that allows our um, town clerks to take it and it gives them basic knowledge about uh, cybersecurity. Just to give it and put it in perspective, 80 to 90 percent of all breaches to systems, not just not just election systems, but any system, 80, 80 to 90 percent of them are caused by a phishing email where they send a phishing email out and someone responds back not knowing what it is. You know, it'll, it might say it's from your bank and, and you need to access, uh, we, we need your information so we can make sure that your system is secure. People will fill it out and send it back. That's the kind of thing that we are trying to prevent because that is the biggest factor, the biggest breach to these systems. So we've, like I said, we've, we provide that secure the human training. We also added this summer two-factor authentication, just like a bank online does. Um, uh, where you have you, you log into your your bank and then they say okay you got to you got to get a, uh, a a second code pin number to put in uh, we have the same thing now it's really about situational awareness and, and that's what we're focused on is having that situational awareness so that we can provide the information not only to the town clerks but also up the chain up the ladder to our federal partners as well uh, election confidence, we're confident that Vermonters' votes will count. Uh, we did pr recently provide a uh, op-ed about co confidence in the system. We are working diligently to uh, prevent fraud and hacking. Uh, we have a decentralized system, as is most of the country. Uh, our tabulators, the, the 135 towns who do use tabulators, those tabulators are not connected to the internet by either hardwire or Wi-Fi. There's no remote access software in them either. Um, we have what I consider to be best practice, and that's a voter marked paper ballot. Uh, and on top of that, we do a post-election audit uh, where we are able, that's a public process, you'll all be getting notice about that. That'll happen within 30 days of, of the election. We usually do it over at the uh, Pavilion Auditorium in a very public place. Uh, where we'll receive ballots from certain towns that have ran been randomly selected. We've been doing audits since 2006, and we've never found a discrepancy. As I said earlier, we, da we do a daily backup of our, all of our databases, so at worst case, we can go back 24 hours, um, and we work closely with our town and city clerks. I, at this point, you know, I've got my manager of IT here, I've got my elections director and my deputy here, so if you have any questions, we'll, we'll entertain those questions. What's the thing that wakes you up at night and you end up in a cold sweat? Um, just in general, the fear that, that uh, uh, we, we miss something, um, I, I don't think we have. The, the guy sitting to my left here, uh, John Welch, is has got a Def Department of Defense uh, military background in cybersecurity, so he's, he's very familiar with this stuff. Uh, and, um, uh, but, you know, anybody that says to you, uh, Wilson, that, that the, uh, oh, we're fine, we're good, we're strong, and, we're, and we're, we're not in any danger, that's a person I would be worried about. Um, the bad actors will evolve over time. They will try yesterday, and if they couldn't get in, they'll try a different way today. And if they couldn't get in today, they'll try a different way tomorrow. The issue is, do we have the systems, the defenses in place? And, uh, you know, we, we constantly are reviewing. John will come to me, make some suggestions. We actually rely on, the, that's what a, a penetration test and a vulnerability assessment, that's what those are about, is to 
see if they find anything that could help us make it better. I mean, are there two, two hundred, was it 246 voting counts or whatever the figure was? Is there a concern that, you know, in any one of those, somebody could fail the two-factor authentication test or respond to that email, the phishing email, and uh, would that let them in? Well, the bad that's, a, that's a great question. And, and um, because of the way, that, just like online banking, uh, with a two-factor authentication, uh, someone would have to have access, but that email is already predetermined where that pin is going to go to. So it's not like uh, it's, it's, you can plug it in and say, oh, send it to this email, because it's already predetermined. We've already worked with our town clerks to set that up. Um, it's, 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 you know, there is no, it's a computer system, Wilson, and there is no, I, I can't say 100% will, you know, nobody will get hacked. That, that's, that's the fact of reality. No, I, I guess what I'm asking is if somebody gets hacked, somebody in pick your little town, big town, whatever, they respond to the, e the phishing email, they give up the, uh, the keys to the kingdom, would that let the bad actor into the entire system through town X? No. It's still limited to their access within the uh, election management system. They're, they're, it's compartmentalized down to they only have access to a certain portion of what they are responsible for. So they would only get be able to deal with town X. Correct. They don't have Possibly. limited access. Possibly. To the right. Okay. You said that 2016 changed everything, and I'm sure in the past <laughs> two years a lot to have changed since then. What are some of the big, um, you know, what are some of the big changes, big things that you're worried about in this election that you might not have been worried about in 2016? Well, I think overall, uh, what I would say is that, that first of all, um, in, 20, in 2016, there were 21 states that were hacked. One state was breached. Uh, that state, by the way, was Illinois. Um, but the, what gets lost, everybody focuses on the one state that was breached. What gets lost is that there were 20 states that, that actually defended against that attack. Um, and, and let's make no mistake about it, an attack on our election systems is an attack on our democracy. Um, and I think that really is the concern I have, is that someone might be successful. Um, I'm pretty confident that we're in pretty good shape here. We, have a mo we monitor the system. We have a, a real-time monitor that monitors all the internet traffic coming into the system. And it goes back to the Center for Internet Security. Uh, for their review, and within 15 minutes, they can let us know if they see an anomaly or uh, 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 um, uh, see that we're being under under attack. You know, it's we've got other systems in place. We've got web application firewalls in place. We've we have many. Uh, I, <laughs> I one time I said to John, I said, can, "Can you give me a visual of what we have in place?" And he said, sure. And I looked at it and I said, this would be great. Can I give this to Peter? And he goes, no, I'd have to shoot you then. So uh, it, it's really, it, it's a map of our system and we can't obviously provide that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really, we have tremendous, I, I'm trying to convey that we have tremendous amounts of, of defenses that are in place and we're constantly monitoring it. We're constantly uh, checking it out. You might remember that if, uh, it was a few weeks ago, uh, you know, it was reported, I think, on NBC News that we had reported to the Department of Homeland Security that um, we had received a point of uh, the origin of country uh, uh, scan from Russia. And even though we defended against it and it was not a, anything that we were concerned about, we were concerned enough about it to send it to DHS to let them know so that they could review it, and then they eventually sent it out to all 50 states to just be on, on the lookout that Vermont had had this situation. Have any of the nine or 10 hygiene scans that have been done by DHS since the primary identified any vulnerabilities? Since the primary? Yeah. Uh, I no. don't think so. No. I'm curious your thoughts. Across the nation, there's been a talk of voter suppression you know, certain states having an exact match. Wondering what your thoughts are on that as we have more people registering than ever in the state. And kind of related, if you ever ran for governor, would you still run the election? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a hypothetical. That's, okay. and, that's a hypothetical, <laughs> and I'm not going to go there because I, I, have, I love my job, and I'm staying right here for now. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But I will say that, that uh, uh, we do not use the exact match Format that, that 
And I don't think very many states do. I think it's only a few, a handful of states that are using this exact match, which can be really problematic. Uh, but we don't use that system. We have, we have multiple factors that are used as criteria. Uh, and keep in mind that our town clerks are the ones that actually add and delete from the voter registry. So uh, when it if it comes in through uh, the DMV or through our online voter reg system, uh, it immediately will re it reads the zip code and the, and the street address and sends it to the correct clerk. So the clerk will then get it when they open up their computer in the morning. Uh, they will have on their dashboard, here's a list of people who have registered to vote, and they have to approve them. So they have to make sure that the address is, is legitimate and that, that, it's, uh, um, that they know, either know the person or whatever else has to, whatever details they need. And once they've approved it, then a notice goes out. And, if it, it, and the system will automatically, if they detect that someone is already registered, the same person is registered, Let's say you're registered in South Burlington and, and when the clerk approves that, it says, oh, that person's also registered in Essex. It will send a notice to the Essex clerks telling them to remove that name. So as to skirt the issue of hypotheticals, do you think Secretary of State Kemp should have resigned his post uh, once he decided? I'll leave that. To, I don't know what their laws and rules are down there. I do think that, um, that there could be a problem down there. Back to the bad actors. Do you think, or do you, do you know, or do you think, I mean, had they let you know, you know, are these bad actors sitting in rooms somewhere on the far side of the world, you know, at their computer screens, oh, let's go after, let's go after Vermont, or, you know, any of the state, you know, like well, the, the GRU fancy bear unit, you know? Yeah, um, first of all, the, the entire intelligence community was able to identify the GRU as being uh, a major player in this thing in 2016. And they've also identified that they're probably going to be back at it again for this coming election. There have been some signs that, that they're involved. Um, but that's, that's above my pay grades, so to speak. Uh, and we have to rely on the Department of Homeland Security to let us know. I know John's in constant communication between the MSISAC as well as uh, with uh, DHS and we're in touch with the FBI as well. So if something were to arise, we would be immediately make contact. We also have here within the state, uh, I think actually uh, Christina Nolan was sending out a press release maybe this morning, um, but th there's a concerted effort between the Department of Public Safety, the Vermont State Police, um, Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, so that we have a, a, a um, communication protocol in place. Um, I, I do want to bring up that, that number again. Um, we do have a hotline number uh, here at our office uh, that will be active on, on, um, uh, on Election Day, and that number is 800-439-VOTE, and the vote stands for 8683. Um, but that's a hotline where they can contact us. Anybody can contact us and let us know if they see if you see something, say something, and, and uh, we will make the determination of where that needs to go, whether it's to the Vermont State Police, the FBI, or Department of Homeland Security. You were just talking a minute ago. I saw this, I think it was, was it in the Bennington Banner this morning? There was a story about uh, duplicate names on the checklist. Is that what you were just talking about? No, I, we didn't talk about that, oh, but, okay. but I can also reference that. We... It doesn't mean they're on the checklist. What it means is they show up as a duplicate on, on their dashboard. Uh, and when the dashboard goes out and looks before that person is accepted, the dashboard will go out and look. Will can probably explain this a little bit better than I can. Uh, but, but essentially, what it does is it looks, there, there's a, as, Wilson, as you might know, uh, when, when we started, when Vermont started to change the driver's license information, they grandfather people without <laughs> birth dates and without uh, uh, social security numbers. Well, now you have to have it when you when you get your driver's license. So what's happening sometimes is you get these duplicate numbers, or you might have someone that's registered in another town, and the system will pull up. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's duplicates on. There probably are, but it doesn't mean that there are duplicates. Uh, you know, a vast number of duplicates that are. 
uh, on the checklist, but we'll go, why don't you, maybe I hit it all. Well, I'm also to clarify a little bit. I, we just read that article this morning, too, Wilson, so I haven't had a chance to follow up with the pending clerk, okay. but I intend to talk with her. And from what I could tell, the nuance didn't come through in the article to distinguish between, yes, there are a lot of folks who may already be on a person's checklist who register again via either the DMV process or online voter reg, but the same person applying who is on the checklist doesn't mean that the end result of that application is two records in the checklist. And the way that works is that these records, like Secretary Thomas said, come through the clerk's dashboard on their management system. But when they click through to process those to add a person's name to the checklist, an application is one thing. Clerk has to add the name through action that they take. And as they're doing that, the system searches their checklist, finds a duplicate, a person with the same name, and says, hey, this might be the same person. Check this out. Cassie, the clerk in Bennington, described that there are these voter records out on her list that are, are, are long-standing voter records that have been in her town for a long time. They may not have a date of birth in the record or a driver's license number. They'll still be found as a potential duplicate. And what she described, and I believe what she's doing, is then you, you identify that as, yeah, that's the person, and you add that information to the record. So I... It uh, merges it. It merges it. Edit. And we Edit. end up... You edit the record, and then they end up as a single one. I think we what we end up with is a record with better information. But but also Wilson, I do I do want to just touch base with uh, because there will always be duplicates on any voter registration sure. database in the country, uh, and you know it, it's not illegal to be registered in more than one place or more than one state. What is illegal is to vote in the same election in more than one place. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, it's the same thing with charges that there's dead people on the checklist. There will always be dead people on the checklist. Uh, it, it takes time for those, those uh, you know, the, I guess the, the simple way to say it is dead people don't have a, have a tendency not to inform us that they're not around anymore. And, and so that information will, will show up until we get a record change, uh, whether it's through the, um, what is it, through Social Security? Department of, Health. Department, Department of Health. But it might take time, depending on where that person died. For instance, if they died in Lebanon, New York, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, that's in New Hampshire, it's not in Vermont. So it might take time for that thing to show up through the Vermont Department of Health before it gets sent to us. Um, and you know, again, the clerk is the one that has to make those changes. So that doesn't worry you? I think that it's a red herring. I, I really do think it's a red herring. And, and I think that uh, uh, a lot of fuss is made about it, but you know, the only fuss should be if, if those people are actually voting. Uh, there was a case in North Carolina uh, several years ago where the Attorney General had this big press conference and said he found post-election that 900 people had voted uh, that were dead, and it turned out little story that came out a f few months later was when they investigated those 900, like 890 of them were actually people who had voted early and then passed away prior to election day. But it still goes down as an election day vote. Yes, yeah, it does count. Once, once, you're, once you submit your ballot to the town clerk, that's a legitimate vote. <laughs> so. Jim, I would say just to add to that too, at both the federal level and the state level, the voter registration laws, federal level National Voter Registration Act, and then our registration laws are, in my mind, by design, it's easier to get on the checklist than it is to remove a name from the checklist. And that's, that's again, by design and I think makes sense, um, but that is why you sometimes end up with duplicates and people who have moved and people who have passed away. Do you, do you have a turnout estimate for next week? Oh, no, I wouldn't even attempt. I, it'll be better than 14, but it's not. I don't know if it'll be as good as 16. Uh, 14 was a, a particularly bad uh, voter participation year, um, but I think that uh, what we're seeing so far with the numbers, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Eric, do you have a copy of that? I don't, Wilson wasn't here. I do. It's actually sitting in one of those folders right over there. All right, we'll so get it to you. But we have updated numbers as of this morning. Um, and we've already surpassed, uh, we've, we've already surpassed the number of ballots received back 
than the total for 2014. And the next week is a big week for ballots coming back in. So um, we expect to see those numbers climb. Earlier you mentioned in pre-trial time the, the backup of a paper ballot. At, explain to people at what point, if there were to be any kind of an issue, at what point do you go to those as um, a, source to, a source to count votes? Great question. Um, this past year, uh, the legislature actually uh, gave authority to the Secretary of State to be able to, if, if, if the Secretary of State believes that perhaps the uh, machines have been compromised in some way, to order a pull the plug and go to hand count on all ballots. Uh, keep in mind, our voter marked ballots, after the election, at, that, at the polling place, they will place them in the bags and seal those bags, and those are kept for 22 months. Uh, they can't destroy those for 22 months in case there are any uh, questions or recounts or uh, we do the audit and that town is chosen as one of the towns that we are gonna audit. So um, there's very strict uh, custody, chain of custody for those ballots, uh, and they're kept in their vaults. Is the tabulator the machine that counts the ballots? Yeah, it's a, it's, an, it's a scanner, essentially. A tabulator is a scanner, uh, and, and it actually, all it does is, is, is scan that ballot to see where, where the ballot, the, uh, the, the choices that were made, and it records that. And keep in mind, right after the election, when they shut down the, at, at 7 o'clock, the first thing that they do is they pull all those ballots out, and they put them in packs of 50, but they also go through every ballot to see if there's any discrepancies. Uh, you know, someone might have, instead of, uh, they might have circled the name instead of filling in the oval to make sure, or write-ins. Uh, <coughs> they will go through and, and actually visually inspect each ballot before they actually pack them away. Does the new uh, AVS system, does that have a possibility for Wi-Fi connectivity? No. So it's completely secure? Independent. It's a single-use tablet. It has no other programming on the tablet whatsoever or Wi-Fi capability. As our tabulators are, too. They're just a, uh, they're not connected in any way, not to each other or uh, to, the, to the Internet. I mean, just to play devil's advocate, the, the tabulators, so then somebody has to go in and, and flip up the little counter and look and write down the amount, the number for each candidate? And then do they have to manually trans transfer that? So and where what, you get transposed what, numbers and things. What occurs, Wilson, if you you know, maybe you go to at seven o'clock at, at the polling place here in Montpelier, but what happens is there's a key on the back of the machine and if they turn it to one direction or the other, I forget which, uh, when they turn that key, they can actually shut down the, the, the scanning capability and then it'll it'll summarize the totals that have come up. So it's like a register tape. Prints a tape. Uh, it prints a tape, and they're required to print two tapes. One goes in the bag, and one they, 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 um, they maintain, they keep, so. But they transfer the, the digits manually. They transfer those digits manually, that is correct. So there's no, it's not yeah, an automatic. That's an important well, distinction. Well, no, the idea is somebody when, you know, can transpose some numbers <laughs> as they're doing it. When Jim said it's not <laughs> remotely connected, yeah. Any kind of remote access software, well, that's more about maintenance or Wi-Fi connection. Some of the tabulators in other states may automatically transmit those vote totals. Ours print out a tape that's a, like a cashier's tape, and then just like you said, it's a manual entry by the clerk from that tape into our election management system for the election night reporting. And you asked 20 minutes ago what keeps you up at night. And my honest answer to that question is those kind of human errors, not intentional hacking. Actually, the, the biggest problem we've had has been human error. Uh, if you go back, you know, Wilson, you've been around for a while. Uh, 2006, Randy Brock versus Tom Salmon. Um, Randy Brock won that night by 180 votes. There was a recount requested by Tom Salmon, and it turned, it was a complete flip where Randy, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Salmon won by 180 votes. What occurred when the, when the, the, the uh, team went back and looked at it, uh, this is none of us, this was before us, it predated us, but what occurred was that there were 15 hand count towns that transposed numbers. So it was, it was a manual process uh, and, and that's what caused that, it was 15 towns 
that were that caused that error. To your knowledge, has uh, has there been an instance of um, compromise data we've had to go back to the paper ballots? Not that I'm aware okay. of. Yeah. No, and we've we like I said, we've been doing audits since 2006, right. and we've never found a discrepancy. Would that recount be discrepancy? No, because um, that we don't consider that to be a, a, an, audit. a an audit. The audit. I'll, we consider recounts to be audits in a sense as well, but typically it's it's usually the same thing. It's a human error kind of thing, where someone human eyes will have you. you if you go back to 2000 in Florida, it was the human eye and the hanging chads. Is that was that actually there or not? Was that a vote or not? And and that's where you run into problems. Um, and now we have a state of the art audit system that we use. Uh, where we actually end up, not only do we end up with a, with a good, clean audit, but we also end up with uh, a file of all the ballots. We actually have a printout of those ballots uh, from that race. And that's why I think, to, to be precise, right, too, is that the audits have never shown any indication that the tabulators are mistabulated. Just one last thing, Jim, maybe if I could, to go back to what keeps me up at night and, and what has changed a lot since 2016. Mm -hmm. It's the, the misinformation and disinformation online. Um, we Clearly. Have, we have a lot more evidence now of concerted attempts to, uh, to sow chaos and to undermine faith in our democracy came from other countries. It comes from within our borders. So we want to be really uh, clear and careful about the information that we put out. We have our, our Twitter account, we have our Facebook account. We really would encourage people to think twice before they link to something uh, that they don't trust, that they aren't sure about. And so I really worry about on election day some false information getting out there and we hope that people will report it to us. If Again, if you see something, say something. Uh, and we'll work with our trusted media partners to get the accurate information out there when misinformation comes our way. And that includes you folks. <laughs> we actually believe in the media. <laughs> is, that, is that what would you say, what you would say is the, you know, the, biggest, the biggest ask you have of voters is to you know, keep an eye on too? Be vigilant. That's right. Well, number one is come out and vote, but, but yeah. number two is, is keep an eye on things and, and don't link to it if you're not sure of the source, because that information spreads at the speed of light and uh, soon gets out of control. So we're constantly on top of our Twitter account uh, on election day and, and hope a lot of people will pay attention to us as the accurate source of voting information. And now that we have this threat dashboard, so if anything, if any other state is seeing something, we can be aware of it through the threat dashboard. Or if something's not responsive on our website, definitely contact us and we're on top of it and our vendors are responsive that night as well. So, Wilson, did you have a problem on election night and primary night? Uh, no, this not phone? this no. year. Several years ago. Okay, so so we did have we <laughs> did have one election like this year we did, ago we did like we did have a problem with um, with Apple uh, Apple devices on primary night through our election night reporting people were trying to access through a, a tablet or through their cell phone and they and they were having trouble connecting it wouldn't connect and it what what occurred was there had been an Apple update in the days before the election that had not been communicated and, and so we had to go back to our vendor for our election night system and make sure that they took that into effect, into account as they uh, prepared for this coming election. So it's working now. What's your name? Chris Winters, I'm the Deputy Secretary. All right, thank you. All right, okay. thanks very much. Thank you. Hope this is helpful.